The category is What the Trans Darling. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to What the Trans. What the Trans? What the Trans indeed. Ashley. Billy Porter just introduced the show. I know, Billy Porter's just introduced our podcast. I am just squeeing with gay pride right now. Like, literally. God, there are so many layers to that sentence. But yeah, wow, you met Billy Porter. I did. I met a whole bunch of people. Um, I'm just going to go quickly. Come. I'm just going to list off who we've got on the show quickly before I ask you how you've been. Because it's mm. a packed out episode. Um, it sure is. I basically bounced around all of the various London Pride events and Black Pride UK and all of that. And I talked to Annie Wallace of Hollyoaks about marching. I talked to J- Diana James, long time veteran of the activist community. I talked to Callum Henderson, the trans community engagement officer for Pride in London. And then I talked to a guy called Billy Porter, who I'm not sure you've ever heard of. Um, he's on some show called Pose, which I may have mentioned from time to time. Once or twice. I'm not going to lie. I was listening back to the interview with Billy and I was just... I, and I don't remember doing any of it because I was running on several different kinds of adrenaline at the time because... Well, I'll get into that later, but basically I'm very surprised that I didn't just vomit immediately all <laughs> over him. Let's just put it that way. And then after that, we have, I talked to Kenny... Ethan Jones, a trans man and mental health advocate who was at Black Pride UK, and he was part of a panel that did a bunch of that talked a bunch about mental health and trans issues and all of the stuff that happens in between those. I then talked to Nate Ethan Watson, who is a trans guy, person of color. He is a rapper, musician, performer who performed on the day on the main stage. I talked to Taja Hamilton, a non-binary person from Stonewall who works there as a client account executive. Just wanted to get their input on what the hell Stonewall were doing there. That came out a bit weird. I mean, it did. of course they're supposed to be there. I don't know. I'm very tired, Ashley. I, I, my phone claims that I have w- walked 26 miles over the last two days, and that has done some strange things to my head. Then I talked... So you might say that it was a real marathon. <laughs> Yes. Yes, it was. <laughs> Sorry, I, I c- literally could not resist. Continue, please. Of course. And uh, then I talked to Wazana Singh Yangwe, uh, who is from Movement for Justice. We'll get into what they're about in a bit. Um, and then I talked to the founder of UK Black Pride, Lady Phil herself, who is a legend in London. I don't know if you will have heard the name. She must have crossed your desk at some point because she's... She has, yes. She is thoroughly a legend and i didn't think she'd remember who i was because i met her many years ago when i was uh working at pink news um and she remembered who i was she saw me and instantly recognized me i was like oh michelle how are you doing long time no see she's lovely um nice and then i talked to shadow secretary of state for women and equalities dawn butler yeah mp for brent central for the labor party in the inner circle with jeremy corbyn and that Yeah. That was a very illuminating conversation, I think. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you will hear very shortly, listeners, you will hear very shortly what she has to say. She does not mince her words. No, no, she does not, in fact, uh, to to a surprising extent. Yeah. Um, So how are you doing, Ashley? How has your week been? Yeah, good. So as I mentioned on the last episode, um, I work at a thing which is currently happening as it's Manchester International Festival. It's a very, very interesting place to work, but that festival is currently taking place from the 4th to the 21st, 22nd of July. That's happening right now. And so I have been to see a bunch of stuff. I saw a thing in a disused railway depot last week. I went to a, uh, what did they call it? They called it um, the Atmospheric Memory Chamber today, which has been constructed at the Museum of Science and Industry. And I was in the crowd of a load of people with bells as uh, we participated in a big Yoko Ono-led project. And later that same evening, I saw Janelle Monet. So I have had quite to the time. Um, I've also actually worked the last seven days in a row. Today's been my first day off. And back in tomorrow, uh, back to it. And good, good heavens, there's been so much, uh, lots of stuff happening, really. Um, so it's kind of taken over my life, as you might imagine. But, you know, hey, Janelle Monet, right? Like, come on. Did her girlfriend show up? Because I was talking to, I was talking to someone at Black Pride and she went to see Janelle 
in London a couple of weeks back, mm. and apparently Lapita Le- Nyong came along and came on stage and were very adorable. Did that happen? Uh, no. No, not on this occasion. And we were kind of hoping, because this was the sort of opening night series of events, so we were hoping that she would be coming along to the opening night party afterwards. But um, uh, she had a flight to Copenhagen, I think, the following morning at like seven. So it's like, yeah, go get some sleep. That's that's what's needed. Um, and so that did not occur. And it was a slightly different, slightly shorter set than the one I saw her do on the Dirty Computer Tour last year, last September, I want to say. So... Uh, but it was, ah, oh, what a gig, what a performer. She was just brilliant. Um, and obviously the audience, once again, hella queer, so queer, <laughs> um, hearteningly queer. It just gave me all sorts of hope. Manchester Pride hasn't taken place yet. That's at the end of next month, at the end of August. But several hotels and businesses and stuff have decided to get their virtue signaling in early and put their rainbow flags up. So that was nice, even just around the... Castlefield Bowl, this outdoor area in Manchester where gigs happen, and there was one or two rainbow flags just fluttering, as well as every time a train went past, all of the passengers on it just looked incredibly confused. Um, <laughs> so it's just like, what is that happening in a car park? It's like, yeah, it's Janelle Monet, so uh, it's cool. I mean, it's not like it, it's not like everyone can say they saw the ma- the magnificent Janelle Monet perform in a car park in the Manchester city centre. That, that is not a usual venue for someone of that stature. I mean, so actually, I say it's a car park. It kind of looks like one from the rails, but it is, so it's called Castlefield Bowl, and it is like a kind of amphitheatre, half amphitheatre thing, where there's these like, sort of stepped seats uh, facing out over some open ground, obviously, where the stage was. So to call it a car park, um, you know, denigrates it slightly i suppose anyway um so i've had quite a fun week if if if, even if at times it's been terribly busy and on friday night and i'm i I used to previously i would have said i'm not proud of this but literally friday night i went to bed at half nine that's how rock and roll i am um that's something to be proud of these days because there is a big culture in london at the very least and probably elsewhere where it's like, oh, I work so hard, I went to bed at 4am and got up at 4.05 to go back to work. And it's like, that's not something to brag about. No. Early nights are a good thing. Basically, you know, you, you can't, you do need to sleep to be functional, and let's not pretend otherwise. But yes, let's just... Uh... Yeah, are we going to do some terrible news? We are going to do some terrible news, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible news... This bye week, our rather brief look at the news has a bit of a theme, and that theme is people showing their true colours. Now allow me to explain. So the two stories this week are both kind of unsurprising, but definitely revealing. So firstly, here in the UK is a very UK focused news episode this bye week. Very sorry about that for our listeners overseas. But yeah, it's kind of where we are. And um... well, yeah, it's it's been a pretty quiet one in some respects. Pride well, seems to have sucked away a lot of the oxygen. I suppose. But there were a few things that made it through. To it, the Stonewall Children and Young People's Conference, which took place in London on July the 5th. So it's, that's just a few days ago as we're recording this. So as you might imagine, this conference was a fairly wholesome gathering, which is aimed at broadening Stonewall support for young LGBT people in primary, secondary schools and public services. But, as you also may have heard, some of our old friends decided to join in the party and bring along their photo collection too. So outside the conference they gathered, the same maybe 12 hardcore people who call themselves feminists who turn up at all of these things. They carried placards which carried the same nonsense messages as before, like transition erases lesbians and transing kids is abuse. Transing. Um, (laughs) But this time they had a new trick to show us, extremely graphic post and mid-surgery photographs printed on large signs in an attempt to associate trans medical procedures with shock and disgust. Does this sound familiar? Can you think of another group of reactionary fundamentalist bigots who picket outside buildings with offensive slogans and graphic imagery? Because all of this sure does sound like the anti-choice movement to us. So perhaps they've been learning some tips from their friends on the American religious right. Ellen Murray, the director of Northern Ireland-based organisation Transgender NI, and many other people made this comparison on Twitter, positing the reason that these tactics specifically are being used is because there is a huge overlap in the communities of anti-trans and anti-choice, quote-unquote, activists. So it does feel like the mask has slipped just that little bit further. 
Now, it's worth noting as well that in a separate incident later on the same day, a group of anti-trans protesters were actually asked to leave the National Theatre's bar. On social media, this theatre has released a statement that it had removed the women due to a series of disturbances. It's understood that they were wearing t-shirts proudly declaring themselves to be lesbians, which is entirely fair enough, but also carrying signs with anti-trans slogans, which very much isn't. So this series of disturbances seems to have begun with the group refusing to put their placards out of sight and culminated in abusive behaviour towards the theatre's staff, according to their statement. One of the group, a notorious anti-trans campaigner, complained on Twitter that they were removed because they don't like the t-shirts we were wearing. But the theatre refuted this, saying, The National Theatre has not and never would discriminate against an individual on the basis of their sexuality, or indeed because they were proudly wearing this on a t-shirt. We do, however, respect and value our trans staff, company and audience members, and as such, if the behaviour of the visitors impinges on their ability to feel supported and safe, we will take action. So two things, same day, anti-trans protesters causing a bit of a stink with uh, a new trick that we've seen in the anti-abortion lobby. So while this isn't surprising, it is also like, well, that is very telling. Isn't it? That shows us something, I feel. What do you think? I think that potentially the same people that showed up outside the Stonewall event are probably the same people who decided to go to the National Theatre bar. And it's, it's, it's possible. I haven't seen any demonstration of that. I haven't seen anybody saying, oh, yes, it definitely was or whatever. I'm just aware of these two incidents on the same day. I... To me, I'm thinking of it as the same group because that comforts me more than two groups of hideous, nasty, anti-trans nightmare people going around London carrying anti-trans placards. I like to think there's just the one group of people doing that, but it's it's unconfirmed either way. You know, unclear, so unsure. Yeah, do you think that this is because... Pride in London, as we will be going into in greater detail later on, basically tightened up their security and basically made it almost impossible for TERFs to do anything at Pride in London, that they were trying to create a flashpoint elsewhere? Mm -hmm. I think, yes, they're definitely trying to insert themselves into the narrative. And you'll note that they did this on a conference at a Friday, which is kind of before... You know, that's immediately before the weekend stuff kicks off, right? Obviously, because it's immediately before the weekend. Well done, Ashley. That's how a calendar works. <laughs> um, but I do think they were trying to steal a march in terms of the narrative and get the name out there. And they have done that and well done us for carrying on, you know, discussing it. But... Uh, I think the parallel that people have drawn to the anti-choice protesters is a very, very salient point because, as has been observed before by a lot of people, the anti-choice lobby are generally just anti-bodily autonomy. And I don't use the word fundamentalist lightly. I think there is a very, very real case for using that word in the, the you can't essentially gender fundamentalists, insisting that things are this or this and no other ideas can possibly be countenanced. So the idea that the, you know, the placards that they had had the same canards on it, you know, lesbians are being silenced, lesbians are being erased. And it's like, that's bollocks, because if anything, we're making more lesbians, because so many <laughs> trans women, so many trans women I know are dating, are dating other women, cis and trans. So, you know, to say that we're erasing it, it's like, no, no, honey. But it's this, you know, it's the same group of people whose names I'm not going to bother reading out. Um, but you could, Literally just kind of find out, find that one out on Twitter. Um, I'm not going to read them out. I think people listening already know roughly who was Probably. there. Like, Probably. I haven't had the time to go into this, but I I know exactly who was there from what you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just kind of get, you get the idea, don't you? So I do think they've popped up right now this weekend. A, because that conference was taking place. Like, um, and, and it is Pride Weekend in London where they had an impact last year. But as you say, the kind of, the response from Pride in London and its community groups and its parade to the stuff that happened last year, you know, what what was it like? The first five entries of, of the London Pride Parade were all like L with the T, G with the T, Diva with the T, etc. Yeah, it was all with the T. And then all the way through the parade, there was like most of the floats had trans people on the fourth run or had trans flags. Basically, yeah. well, we'll go into this later, but basically this Pride in London, it would have been very hard for them to have done it. So yeah. it makes sense that they were trying to start something somewhere else to hopefully get in the papers, which the Gu they, they did. The Guardian reported it as 
I'm sure the Turfs wanted it reporting, which, yeah, thanks, yeah, yeah. Guardian. I mean, I always hope for better, but I do expect this kind of thing from you now. Well, they did, so the, the Guardian definitely did that when it comes to the uh, National Theatre incident, just, again, in, just in terms of the headline, which was, you know, group of lesbians asked to leave National Theatre, which makes it sound like it's discrimination, and it wasn't. It's, it wasn't discrimination. It was kind of like, well, these people are doing and saying things that are very much against the policies and expected behaviors within a fucking theater. You know, like there, there, there are rules. There are societal rules that people agree to when they go to a theater or a bar or a restaurant. And if you're not abiding by it, people can and will ask you to leave. And that's what was happening. And it was nothing, you know, as the statement I thought made quite clear. It's like, yeah, great. You're wearing it on a t-shirt, but you're still a dickhead. So. I mean, if you go, if you turn up at any bar with big old, like, I don't know, I saw some pictures and the pictures they had, like the banners mm. they had were quite big. They were almost as tall as the people holding them. If you yes. show up to any bar with graph, with massive pictures of close-ups on surgeries, you're probably going to be asked to, at the very least, you know, stash them away somewhere. Pop them away. Yeah. Which, I mean, that's, that's what started this off. They just kind of refused to do that and to became belligerent which good heavens how how surprising is that hey this is michelle just dropping in some updated info about the turf invasion of the national theater green room bar as we have just discovered that the situation had another wrinkle that the guardian chose not to report Lila Johnson, a gender fluid photographer and visual artist who was taking photos of the event, reported on their Twitter feed that the turf group were kicked out of the bar, not solely due to their transphobic t-shirts, but because they interrupted drag queen Easy Street's performance at the River Stage, claiming that the queen sexualized children. We will provide a link in the description for this Twitter thread so you can check out the photos yourself. So... The Guardian failed to mention this and chose to present this as oppression against lesbians instead of what it actually was, a bunch of beastly bastards doing a big old homophobia. Great stuff. Now you know that. Back to the past. I think there's very little else that could be particularly said about this particular aspect of it, so we shall move on um, onto a slight roller coaster of a story in that it has its peaks and troughs and involves a couple of different things, but again, it does demonstrate something. So a few episodes ago on the podcast, we talked about tennis player Martina Navratilova and her, to us, highly questionable views about trans women and their inclusion in sport. So she's previously said that trans women participating in sport was insane and cheating, and suggested that male competitors could simply drop a few hormone pills, compete as a woman, win a load of medals due to some sort of advantage, and make money. So... Which, obviously, as a person who can no longer lift her own base amp after hormone replacement therapy, that's hilarious. <laughs> and it seemed like a remark born from pure ignorance. This is just another cis person talking about things that she doesn't understand, but the media loves that sort of thing, and so a lot of people heard her say it. Subsequent to all of this, it was announced that Navratilova would be making a documentary with the BBC which would explore the issue, and will be called The Trans Women Athlete Dispute. So immediately alarm bells began to ring. Dispute? Really? We've gone from debate to dispute? I thought we had more time. However, to the surprise of many, including us, the finished programme, which went out at the end of June, and was good, actually, more or less. Navratilova started off holding the same views about trans women that she's already expressed, but over the course of the documentary, she met and spoke to trans athletes and seemed to gain a deeper level of understanding and, crucially, empathy as well. She even stated towards the end of the documentary that society has changed so much, the rules need to evolve. If you don't evolve, you've got problems. And concluded that including trans athletes in sport is a positive step. So it truly seemed as if she'd had a change of heart after actually learning a little bit more about it. Good heavens, how surprising that is. However, of course, this was clearly some sort of fever dream or Matrix-level simulation, because within a day on Twitter, Navratilova was back on her bullshit, stating that she hasn't changed her mind, with a social media mob of nightmare people jumping into the comments claiming misrepresentation. So to the cynical listener, this whole thing might seem as if the Beeb have just given some free publicity to a transphobe, but of course, we wouldn't suggest anything of the kind. So, yes, roller coaster. It started off bad, and then we all thought, oh, wow, that's, that's actually quite good. She's learned. Hooray, change. And then, actually, no. Cruelly yanked away from us at the last second. I haven't learned a thing! So, yes, disappointing, not surprising, but again, it's kind of, like, quite revealing because, well, clearly there's somebody that just does not want to listen to facts. 
<laughs> yeah, I think the thing here, I mean, Martina has... I don't think she's ever really uh, directed or written or created a documentary before. I think she's been in plenty of them, but I don't think she was necessarily on... She was presenting the documentary, but she wasn't like on the creative team. I don't think she was there in the editing room or necessarily had final say in the documentary because based on what she did after the documentary came out, it sounds like she went through the whole thing and kept her opinions going in the all the way through but then the bbc came in and made the documentary themselves if you see what i mean mm. then again i don't know for sure because i wasn't there in the room but that's what this whole thing stank of and then she went off and continued as she was going to do which pretty much fucking sucks especially considering that she was there talking to trans athletes like there's footage of it now it's on camera yeah you can go on iPlayer and watch it right now and i don't know how long it's going to be there for but it's you could go see it if you want it would appear that she changed her mind but then again she didn't i guess it's just it's just completely undercut by what happened afterwards isn't it because so so al who we've talked about before who's a non-binary uh, writer who's got a regular column in the metro and occasionally writes for the guardian so they wrote that you know immediately after the documentary had aired that wow i'm so glad that this happened it was good to see it move forward if martina navratilova's views can evolve so can sports uh, which was then just cruelly yanked away from us a couple of days later. And it's like, well, you know, g- g- gave that documentary quite a generous interpretation. And it turns out that it wasn't coming from a sincere place or it maybe was and she just walked it back. Or perhaps it was simply Navratilova trying to give a bit of respectability paint to her anti-trans mates. I don't know. It's But it's a little bit annoying because we had a good thing and then away it went and... There we go. We can't have nice things. Cis people. Cis people. This is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> They're the problem. I think I am choosing to keep the good from this because whilst the drama away from the documentary may have not been exactly encouraging, the mm. vast majority of people watching it will have no idea about any of that, about any of the Twitter drama or any of the in the gender critical community, in the trans community, any drama there, they would have just seen the documentary. And I'm pretty sure that people walking away from that will come away with a more positive outlook on trans athletes and that issue. Well, I mean, we can but hope, so... I mean, I've not really seen anything to suggest otherwise, but, you know, time Mm -hmm. will tell, and... It's a usual thing where I try and come into something with optimism, and then it gets crushed horrifically by bigots (laughs) and bastards, so... And you usually come in actually saying, I told you so. And I hate how often you're right. I hate it. I, in fairness, I don't really like it either. You know, it just, it's, I hate being right all the time. Anyway, um, let's, let's move on, shall we? Before we get sucked into a depressing spiral of uh, nihilism and despair. Yes, and before we move on to the Pride coverage, I was basically covering Pride, and I was at Piccadilly Circus, and honestly, I was just catching my breath, because as I'm going to go, as I'm going to go into later on, I did a hell of a bunch of walking, it was really warm, I stopped there, because there was a bit of a break in the parade, and I saw to my left that there was a big sign saying, free Chelsea Manning, and I was like, oh, okay, this seems like someone I should try and talk to, so I went to the barrier, and I talked to the people involved. It turned out they were from a group called Queer Strike, who are a grassroots, multiracial, lesbian, bi, trans, queer women's group who campaign for all sorts of human rights issues and all sorts of legal rights issues all over the world. And they were holding a demonstration right there and then to try and get the word out on how people in the UK can help set Chelsea Manning free. As we've covered extensively in on previous episodes, Chelsea Manning has been locked up by the US government because she refuses to testify to a grand jury. And a grand jury in the US, we don't really have that here. They only have it in a couple of places in the world. But a grand jury basically can operate completely in secret. And the people involved, their rights are incredibly curtailed. They don't they don't necessarily have a right to representation. And if you refuse to testify, they lock you up, which is exactly what Chelsea Manning has had mm. happen to her. And the case in question is about WikiLeaks and Chelsea Manning made the point that she's already released all of the stuff in other court cases against her over the years, and they can just refer to that to get her say. And she deeply doesn't believe in the 
in the system they have there, so she said no. Sort of gave a fuck you, and then she's been locked up. So Queer Strike are doing a campaign at the moment where they're trying to get British people to act on this. And I spoke to Dee Dee Rossi earlier today, actually, because there was no way I was going to get any good audio right there from the parade route. It was too noisy, too much going on, too much joy. So I basically arranged to speak to her this morning on Skype. And yeah, we had a really good conversation. Here it is. Hi, Dee Dee. Thank you so much for talking to me. Hi, Michelle. Thanks very much for inviting us onto your program. So would you like to tell uh, the listeners a little bit about your organisation? Yes, Queer Strike is a multiracial, lesbian, bi, trans, queer plus organisation um, in the global women's strike. And we have been organising with Payday Men's Network, uh, which includes trans men, uh, to defend Chelsea Manning and get her out of prison again. Um, we were part of the international grassroots movements who got Chelsea Manning out in um, 2017 uh, after many protests, many, you know, leafleting, uh, I mean, all sorts of different actions that people did from many different countries. Um, and now she's been put back in prison for refusing to testify against WikiLeaks. Yeah, um, it might. We've gone over this on the show before, but probably good to have a refresher. Um, could you explain what the grand jury system in the US is and why Chelsea Manning has made a stand against it? Um, well, from from what I from what I know, I actually just so as people know that Chelsea Manning is a trans woman whistleblower who exposed the war crimes of the US and other governments um, in Iraq and other countries. Um, the grand jury system. I just know that she's been she's been jailed for sixty two days. Uh, she refuses to testify against WikiLeaks in front of a secret grand jury. Uh, and WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange is now in jail, and they've uh, the grand jury has issued 18 charges, which are secret. They're actually in a secret envelope. The U.S. government has is not allowing people to see, so it's not it's very very dangerous precedent. And um, if found guilty, Julian Assange of WikiLeaks founder could get a sentence up to 175 years, and it's really an attack on all whistleblowers including Chelsea, um, and she's taken a very principled stand saying that basically the, the federal government is using uh, this to disrupt political opponents and activists and harass people. And we must get her out of jail because they're also fining her financially uh, $500 a day after 30 days and $1,000 a day after 60 days, which she is basically challenging but at the moment that's also hanging over her and I'd like to just add something else that in addition to um, her being put in prison she's also being denied follow-up care following her gender confirmation surgery so again she's being discriminated against as a trans woman prisoner and there's lots of things that people can do but I don't know if um, you had a bit more questions and then I can maybe make some, some practical suggestions if people would like to do um, stuff to, you know, to help her get her out. Well, I think that's important to go into because um, when we've been reporting on this story, um, finding way, we usually try when we're reporting on things to try and find ways that the listeners can help. But with this, apart from you know a bunch of retweeting and stuff, it doesn't appear to be that much that many obvious actions that people in the UK can take. So what can we do to help Chelsea right now? Well, what we've done before and what we're, we're doing now is, well, one thing we did was at Pride, in fact, where we met you, which was great. We had a big banner saying free Chelsea Manning with her photo. And we got a very, actually a very good response. So more and more people are knowing about her and her situation and we're very positive to, and we gave out lots of leaflets, um, including practical things. You can write to Chelsea, which you have to do in a very specific ways, which we, we have on our Queer Strike Facebook, because um, you have to write to her with her prison number, which is A018 one eight one four two six 
her Chelsea Elizabeth Manning. And then we have the address, which we could read out now if you want us to. And you um, you can write to the prosecutors. Again, there's um, a specific link which we have on our Facebook to write to the prosecutor saying why you think she shouldn't be prosecuted and why she should be released. There's also um, a petition. There's a Chelsea's legal fund. Uh, again, to get help, financial help for her. Now, the other things that people can do is before when she was arrested the first time, um, she we did things like people did leafleting, for example, even in Italy, in Greece, in Germany, in the US, people have done leafleting sessions, even with just two people, one person, two people. You can choose occasions like a court date. You can do if there's some sort of LGBT event happening at your area. Um, you can have placards. We have like, we love Chelsea and then people give out leaflets and then people come and ask. Uh, we've done things like on St. Martin's on the field step in Trafalgar Square. We've done silent protests with a big, you know, free Chelsea Manning uh, banner. Um, there's direct action stuff that people have done, like even, you know, lots of different things that people can do. Every, every, and Chelsea, by the way, said how fantastic it was to get letters in prison and she has actually written letters out so it is really important to support her um, because they put her in solitary again now she's out of solitary but she needs to know how much support is out there internationally and um, anything, you know, for her birthday on the 17th of December is when we did, if she's still inside, that's when we did protests at St. Martin's in the field. So public, just keep her in the public eye. And she's also done a fantastic statement on the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, you know, where she, I mean, she just talks about the, you know, anti-capitalist. She talks about also the trans women of colour, who have been killed and also the Latino immigrant trans women who have been killed by the US authorities in in detention centers she's called on you know for she's called defending all our communities she's called for the full decriminalization of sex work she's defended young people of color who have been killed by the police you know speaking out against police violence and we really, she's really one of our leaders. We have to defend her. We have to get her out before they do anything worse to her. Okay. Um, how is Chelsea doing? Have you been in contact with her? We haven't been able to be in direct contact with her. But we, we, she did actually last time when she got out of prison, um, wrote to us and Payday Men's Network, um, one of her sort of thank you form, thank you uh, letters. But she's very appreciative, and we don't know um, at the moment how she's doing. But we do know that she's done this fantastic statement, uh, fifty years on from Stonewall. So she's in very good spirits, in fighting spirits. And it's really, we have that on our Facebook. It's really worth going on uh, on the internet and, and just circulating that um, because, you know, she's really also speaking out in support of the anti-war movement, as always, that she's part of. And um, it's just a fantastic statement, you know, also calling on pride to say we don't want, you know, a society that relies on prisons, police, borders and military interventionally is fundament fundamentally at odds with queer and trans lives. And, you know, she's also said, which we thought was great, we are here because we know that there, sh there should be no pride for some of us without liberation for all of us. And again, she's really given leadership and direction to this, you know, our social movements for liberation. So we don't know, as I said, directly, but the more people write to her, the more people tweet, you know, take photos with I love Chelsea Manning, get that round, the, the stronger that she'll keep on fighting inside. And also that the authorities see how much support she has internationally is really a lifesaver. Um, we were we we were leafleting in support of Chelsea, and at the same time, uh, members of Queer Strike and All African Women's Group um, were 
and Women Against Rape were leafleting and they had a great response for uh, Miss, Miss Mohammed, who's a refugee who fled to safety from Pakistan, a lesbian woman, a lesbian mum. She fled to Pakistan after her abusive husband discovered she was a lesbian. And she is, we are doing a campaign also on her behalf with her to um, be reunited with her son who defended his sister against abuse in Pakistan and defended his mum. So, and her hearing is on the 20th of August. So, in a way, seemingly a separate issue, but completely connected and something that, you know, as I said, Chelsea has supported the rights of immigrant people and refugee people. And this is something that also your listeners, we really hope, will give support to. And again, we have that on our Facebook as well. Thank you so much for having us on your programme. That's all right. Um, Didi, thank you very much for talking to us. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Wow. So a lot of stuff in that interview, very information heavy, but Queer Strike are, by the sounds of it, one hell of an organization. What? Is... Wow. <laughs> Another thing that we didn't really have um, the time to get into was we talked a little bit afterwards and uh, Dee, Dee made the very good point that Chelsea didn't get as much support as other whistleblowers did before 2017 because of her status as a trans woman. Transphobia and misogyny were apparently factors in why the queer movement and the anti-war movement in general weren't as involved as they have been for other whistleblowers. Mm. That's something that, and she made the point that that is something that has changed significantly in the last couple of years, thanks in general to the general global trans movement raising awareness for trans people, and Mm. also through the work of Queer Strike and other queer anti-war whistleblower defense groups out there have done in getting the message out. So there has been some victories already in that respect, but what shocked me the most is that it's costing Chelsea Manning so much much money money to stay locked up. And the government's charging her, and I had no idea about that. It's like being it's like being in jail and them charging you rent for it. That's ridiculous. But yeah, it's clear the U.S. government are using this as an evil. excuse to. Well, yes, the U.S. government we've covered extensively before that we believe that they are on the side of Satan here, and not the good Satan, not the Satan yeah, yeah. from like Sabrina. Yeah, not that Satan. We're talking about the other Satan, the one that is sponsored by corporate interests <laughs> but <laughs> they are trying i i cannot get past the idea that they are trying to basically ruin her on every way they've taken her freedom they're trying to ruin her financially and obviously you ruin financially that limits what you can do mm. it, it feels like they're just trying to shut her down every single way that they yeah. can so that's why we should fight that yes um so you have options we have you know write to her or um let her know she's supported or take any of the other actions that dd suggested in the interview check out queer strikes facebook page and um there are other global queer action groups and do the thing yeah let's let's help out one of our own i'm gonna stick links on the older reference doc that we have linked to at the end of all of our episodes, I'm going to basically make a big old document with where you can start. Because whilst we are in the UK, the vast majority of the people listening, there are things even we can do, even though there's a big old Atlantic Ocean in the way. There are so many different things we can do to help Chelsea, even from the small thing, from writing her a letter saying how awesome she is. Yeah, and uh, thank you, Dee Dee, for um, coming onto the Skype. Onto the meat, I think. Yes going to cover this in two sections first off we're going to cover pride in london and then we're going to cover uk black pride because they are two separate entities Mm -hmm. a lot of people seem to either lump them in together or just refer to the whole weekend of prides in london as pride in london as one thing but that is not true uk black pride is totally independent and in some respects was started as a response to various issues that pride in Mm -hmm. london themselves were not covering But to start off with, Pride in London. So I went to Pride in London, and I applied for press accreditation, and I got it. But they didn't allow me access to the parade route at first, which I was quite annoyed about because I'm pretty sure I was the only trans media person who was applying for press accreditation, and that turned out to be fairly accurate on the day. And I needed to be there to report on what happened to make sure that Pride in London had seen and learned from last year's mess up. So in the end, uh, I appealed to someone in the press office who was very sympathetic, and they found a way round, where they basically said, bring a camera, we'll stick a sticker on it, and that will allow you on the Pride route, because journalists 
Reporting won't be allowed on the Pride route, but photographers will be. So I borrowed a camera from my good friend Mike, uh, Mike LeBeau. Check him out on Twitter and all the other things. He's amazing. And that got me on the route. So I was there from the start. I arrived, I got there, and lo and behold, what did I see? But the first five blocks were L with a T, G with the T, B with the T, Diva with the T, a uh, friend of the show, Linda Riley's magazine, basically had their own block, and Pride with the T. And leading all of them was the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. And I'm not going to lie, Ashley, I got a little bit emotional at that. Yeah, and see how that might uh, might occur. It was an awesome thing to see. It was absolutely mm. fantastic. Of course, later, when I tweeted out the video I took... <laughs> yes, that was a bit less awesome, wasn't it? Yeah, by far the biggest tweet we've ever done. It's in the thousands of likes and retweets, and we must have received hundreds, of, hundreds and hundreds of messages from every Islamophobe from here to California and everywhere Wonderful. in between saying, oh, you better be careful. Sadiq Khan's a Muslim, and he's going to throw you all off a building. And I'm like... That's clearly not true. He's leading fucking pride. <laughs> yeah, pretty sure. Pretty sure. No, but uh, but then the people that are you know that level of Islamophobic would love to do the same to the LGBT community. They would just you know cream their pants to be in a position where they can use their Christianity as an excuse to throw gay people off buildings. So it's just hypocrisy, really. Anyway, carry on. Yeah, and like all these alt right people that started like fine like. I was expecting some alt-right heat at some point for this podcast, but luckily it's not really happened on this scale before. Mm. But they were very much like, oh, be careful, he's going to want, he's gonna kill you. And I'm like, like you ever gave a shit about LGBT people before you could put the boot into Muslims, you fucking racist twats. Fuck you, fuck you forever. And if you happen to be listening, fuck off forever. Yeah. We don't want you listening. We don't want you following the Twitter. We don't want you remotely involved in any aspect of this podcast. Obviously, we can't stop you downloading the show, but fuck off. This isn't for you. Clearly. What are you fuck doing? Fuck off. Just fuck, fuck off. off and, and then carry on fucking off until you leave the Earth's atmosphere and asphyxiate to death in space. Or That's better than how that, much... go get a spade and beat yourself to death with it. Yeah, and then arrange for your worthless corpse to be thrown into the sun. Anyway, yep. pride. 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 We now, pride. the Pride you Day pride. itself, I did not see any issues or any troubles myself from TERFs or any remotely anti-trans people. In fact, it was the exact opposite. It felt like trans people were very much at the forefront of everyone's mind. Everyone attending, everyone marching. That I have never seen so many trans flags at Pride in London before. I've never seen so many trans supportive signs held up by bunch of cis people cis lgbt people cis straight people it was just all over the show it's as if everyone was on our side and wanted to make it clear to the world that trans people are included and protected and that was a message that was blasted out from almost everywhere i could possibly look and i'm not gonna lie after last year which was so gutting it was so incredible to see that's what you want from pride really isn't it you want an incredible heartening life-giving hopeful fun day so yeah awesome. and also in general like there were a lot less floats this year a lot less big like petrol guzzling floats going around and to my eye there was also a lot less you know corporate blocks like they were there still and mm. by the way to the goons at the disney block fuck you forever because yeah. i was trying to make my way to a refugee group behind them because i thought well there's a refugee group there that's potentially some content for the show that needs to get out there. So I was walking through the Disney block and I stopped for a second and said, I just want to thank you for Endgame because <laughs> Endgame's great. <laughs> the chance of that particular person being involved in Endgame is that's remote, but I did it. And then this guy in a blue shirt came up to me and said, you can't stop, but you can't join the Disney block. And I was like, I'm not, I'm just walking through. I just stopped for two seconds. I'm like, no, you got to go. You got to go. And just almost pretty much assaulted me trying to get me out of there. And then I looked around and there was like five of these guys. And I noticed in all the corporate blocks, some of them had their own security. Which right. were not the most friendly of bunch because they didn't want to risk anyone getting in the way of the corporate image, I guess. Which is interesting because then if one of their hired security goons had literally beaten the hell out of a, you know, a... LGBT refugee of some kind, that would have been an even less good look. So why on earth would you take the risk and hire higher external security? You've got to protect the reputation of the mouse. You've got to protect the image. 
Yeah, don't yeah. fuck with the house of mouse don't do it but yeah i will not but anyway so aside from corporate shittery <laughs> you so you had a you had a super time obviously i know you've done a bunch of interviews uh with lots of all well lots of sexy fun people who um were also at, uh, at pride in london so yes um first up i talked to annie wallace of mm. Hollyoaks. Uh, I think she's the first trans actor in a major soap opera. Is that right? Yes. She's not the first trans character, but she's definitely mm. the first trans actor to play a trans person in a soap opera. You had a very, very quick conversation, and here it is. Annie Wallace, Sally, the head teacher from Hollyoaks, thank you for talking to me. How is London Pride for you? Amazing. Uh, the, the weather has stayed dry. The sun went in, which is great, because I think if the sun had been out, we would have all have been fried to a crisp in this beautiful summer <laughs> weather. And uh, uh, huge numbers. And then the, the red arrows went over, and I just about wet myself. <laughs> so who are you marching with? I was uh, with Channel 4 Pride, uh, but primarily with um, uh, Mermaids, that I'm a patron of. So I was marching and on the bus with them, and it was amazing. Oh, so much fun, but so exhausting. How do you think Pride in London did in regards to security this year compared to last year? Well, I, I didn't see the very front of the parade, but it didn't seem to be stopped by anything. I haven't heard of any incidents. There may have been. I really hope there wasn't. I think maybe after last year, everyone's been very vigilant. Yeah, I was at the front for a bit. I didn't see anything. Good. It was all like diff, like five or six different with the T groups, like L with the T, G with the T, Diva with the T, B with the T. It was all the T. Oh. So many T's. All we need to do now is dot the I's. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. So what are your plans for the rest of the day? Well, um, the first one is to hydrate a bit because I'm quite thirsty and um, just see what's going on. There's a couple of good stages around and uh, maybe have a look at uh, Trafalgar Square. I'm kind of a tourist today. I'm down for the day from Manchester. They don't let me out very often. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm going back to, uh, to Manchester today. So I'm just going to try and fit in as much as, I, as much as my back allows me to, to be honest. Well, I'm going to be around the diva stage for a bit later on, so make sure you pop along and say hi. I certainly will. Absolutely. Oh. Annie, thank you very much for talking to me. Great pleasure. Thank you. I mean, you could tell from the sound of her that she was pretty She was pretty happy with how the day had yes. gone. Bubbly. Nice and bubbly. I like that. I like that kind of effect that Pride has on the people that you speak to, because almost everybody is in just such a super dreamy mood, really, kind of slightly loved up, and particularly the people who've been ingesting Class A pharmaceuticals, uh, which I'm not suggesting for a moment that Annie Wallace has done. I'm just thinking that she just had a splendid day, and yeah. But it wasn't just Annie Wallace, of course, was it? No, I ran into Diana James, who basically, to go through her activist career would take a take quite a while she's been all over the shop working and fighting tooth and nail for the trans community for the intersex community for the lgbt community in general she has done work for homeless people she has done work for victims of domestic abuse she has done loads of work for hiv positive people she has basically been a legendary figure in trans and other activism for many years so i'll just let her take it away yeah Diana James, thank you so much for joining me today at the Diva Stage at London Pride 2019. Why am I saying that so weird? How are you doing? I'm doing absolutely brilliantly. It's a fantastic day. It seems to have been really well organised and lots of groups are really happy with what's been happening. And it suddenly smells horrifically like weed. It really it? does. That was really strong. The diva stage, someone is having a wonderful time. Um, <laughs> if we get the munchies, we'll know why. <laughs> so who are you marching with today? I was marching with Positive East. Uh, what do they uh, do? Yeah, because earlier uh, last year on the History Month, I, they, when they did their history part, they invited three trans people along to do it because they saw that the issues around trans were getting really nasty and they thought it was a good idea to promote that forwards. So there was two speakers on training and I just gave like a personal history of my life, long, sadly, of, um, well, not sadly, I'm not dead, but sad that I'm older than I would like to be. Um, so I, that's where my talk was around my history of being trans, coming out as trans, coming out as lesbian, and some of my issues around being intersex. So you have been all over the activist world 
with like several different causes. So you've been bouncing around the parade, haven't you, between different groups you've been involved with? Yeah, well, I've been wearing different T-shirts. Um, I've been stripping off halfway through Pride and, and changing um, T-shirts. So there might be some pictures of a tall redhead with a red bra on <laughs> flying around. But uh, no, so at the moment I'm wearing a homeless queers started the revolution which is for the outside project but i was marching with positive east and i did uh, one around um, prep for women so and that's really important for trans women especially if they're sexually active is to think about taking prep but it's to find out about it first pros and cons but you should really know that it's available for trans women i'm keen to do some stuff around prep for women and also around like, positive east and that is when I go out to do testing and things is to show that it's available for trans women it's not just for gay men cool what do you think uh, what do you think of the job that Pride in London have done do you think this has been better than last year well it can't have been any worse than last year <laughs> because of what happened at the front of the march I mean to say whose fault and how that happened I think is like by the by now that's in the past we've got to move on from that yeah but today it seemed really well organised. Uh, I got nothing but positivity from the stewards when I was walking past and thanking them for the work they did. Because they're volunteers from the LGBT community. They're not getting paid, and that's their pride, is standing watching everybody else have a good time and making sure nothing bad happens. Yeah. So to the, those volunteers for pride, well, fantastic thanks. We've got to go out. Yeah, did you see the front of the parade? I saw a bit of it. But there was like five much. different groups of like L with the T, B with the T, oh, that's G fantastic. with the T, Diva with the T. I got as many pictures as I could, uh, but yeah. Everyone's with the T. Everyone is with the T. But then that's fantastic because every time we see a protest, we see the same 12 people turning up and telling us how bad we are, holding up photographs that are in line with those ones from uh, America when they're anti-abortion ones yeah. and that sort. And they're now attacking trans men, which they didn't do so much in the past. It was all aimed at trans women. Yeah. But now they're including men. All right, but thankfully they're not here. No, <laughs> and I don't think they're very welcome if they were. They're certainly not welcome at the diva stage. Yeah, they wouldn't last five minutes. No, they'll get, probably get strung up from Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> Diana, thanks for talking to me. At some it's point, we've got to get you on the show to talk about all the work you do. Will you come on the show properly one day? I will do, and it will be an absolute pleasure. And it's lovely meeting you. And you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Like, I don't know if this came across, Ashley, but that smell of weed, I'd never smell anything <laughs> <Yes>. as strong. <laughs> That was the strongest glad... weed I've ever smelled in my life. And I've been to I've been to Glastonbury, I've been to Donington, I have been to Leeds Festival, Reading Festival, I have been to Saget in Budapest. I have done the festival scene. If there is a stronger weed out of there, I would have smelled it, and this was the strongest one. I'm glad that that was such a prominent part of the interview, and I'm really glad that um, we're spending <laughs> this time in the post-interview chat discussing the smell of weed rather than the rather impressive interviewee that you managed to speak to. All but, right, I'll take uh, the hint. Diana James <laughs> is pretty incredible Absolutely. as a person. and I've got a lot yeah. of respect for her. She's bang on right. Like, mm. admittedly, it would have taken a lot for Pride in London to have been worse than last year, but they <laughs> exceeded expectations with this one. Yeah, and I'm obviously I'm glad that's happened. Even you know, I'm not in London; it was ages away, and I've been super busy. But like, even just checking on the stuff is like great, awesome. Nothing terrible has happened, which is a pretty low bar now I think about it. But the point is, it's it seems to have gone up a notch. The moves that Pride in London made to make sure that the events last year were not repeated have definitely worked. I was talking to some people who were involved, but I didn't record them or anything, and they made the point that the police, as well as other parts of the Pride in London organisation, have been following online the, the perpetrators of last year's nonsense to try and figure out if they're going to try anything again and how to act if that is the case. But one particular person said to me that they weren't necessarily doing that entirely to protect Pride in London. They were sort of doing it to protect the turfs themselves because they knew that if they did try something, every cis ally within earshot <laughs> would have murdered them, would have straight mm. up killed them. So if they ever argue that Pride in London doesn't do anything for the gender critical lot, 
I'd argue the Pride in London potentially saved their lives. <laughs> um, yeah, I genuinely would be interested to hear what they make of that particular line of argument. Well, thankfully, um, the Turfs don't tend to listen to our show because it's a bit long for them. They've only got a short attention span, and we tend to have too many facts, so yeah. they tend to leave us alone, especially Absolutely. seeing as we're on every block list from here to forever. Yeah, pretty much. Anyway... Uh, moving rapidly on, let's rattle through these. Uh, you spoke to Callum Henderson. Who is Callum Henderson? Callum Henderson is a very impressive guy. Like, I was, I basically just found myself backstage at the main stage of Pride, and he came up to me and was like, Hello, are you Michelle What the Trans? And I was like, Yes. And he was like, Oh, I'm. I'm Callum. I'm the trans engagement officer for Pride in London. And I was like, Oh, you are exactly the kind of person I should be talking to. Let me get my recorder around. We had a we had a very long chat that unfortunately I did have to cut for time. This is mm. about double the length and all of it was gold. It was really hard to cut this down, but I did. So here is the edited conversation. Callum Henderson, thank you very much for talking to me today. So you are the community engagement officer, the, the trans community engagement officer, is that right? Yep. Would you be able to tell uh, would you be able to tell us what kind of what did you put in place to avoid a repeat of the trouble last year? It started really um, from very early because not only did we want to make ensure what happened last year didn't occur, we wanted more trans inclusion through all the events. By having trans inclusion through all the um, events we run, we would make us more part of the community. So we had a, a 10K run in Regent's Park for the first time. Um, we had a trans boxing event. Um, well, we had the Pride in London boxing event um, on the finals on Thursday. We had three trans guys competing in that. On Thursday, we ran trans cabaret um, that started in New York. And so that was part of our festival. And we had four amazing trans um, singers perform for us. Um, and one of them uh, identifies non -bar. So it was really about having trans people feel welcome in volunteering. We have 200 core of volunteers that volunteer throughout the year. On the day, we train a thousand volunteer stewards. Wow. So we make sure that we train the stewards, that we give them a, um, a lesson of what pronouns are you? Do you say good morning, sir, or madam? Or do you just say good morning? To try and sort of and we give them a little memory sheet and it might not necessarily go through because it's a very pressured environment um, but we're trying to get trans inclusion throughout the whole organisation so um, one of our um, lead parade team is a trans woman we have a trans woman working for us in um, commercial um, engagement so we have many trans people we have many trans um, volunteer stewards on the day and we wanted to make that a safe environment for them because if we're engaging them as volunteers we have a duty to make that safe so it's not just about the day itself it's about ensuring that the whole pride yeah, season the whole pride season is inclusive for all in the community and not just trans people i work as part as the community engagement team and our my manager is a, a wonderful guy it's chris and he's part of the bame community ash is part of the bame community we have a um, women's engagement officer, a young person's engagement officer, a disability engagement officer, a bi engagement officer, um, we're hoping to recruit an intersex engagement officer. We want to really have those people come in and teach us how to make us more inclusive and so that we can help um, different community groups come and be a part of Pride. So my role was to ask the trans groups, can I help you? Have you got enough wristbands? Do you feel that you would like to be part of our events? Inviting them to events, informing them of events that we're putting in to help them give them visibility and trying to connect them with people that would want to sponsor them. So that's part of my role. What this event is really about, as growing up as a kid in London, um, to have a day going shopping where really you come to Pride because you haven't quite come out to your parents yet. Yeah. This is what it's about. For me, as a, a 40 -odd, year old trans guy, it's not about me anymore. It's about trying to make this um, event as friendly and as visible for young people to come along and feel safe. 
because what was amazing last year when I took part in the Pride Parade with the trans um, Scotland flag that we bought, because they had the the protesters had warmed us up, we came through with the flag and we had so much love and whistling blowing that it was amazing. But what was so um, apparent was that there was young trans guys uh, and, and girls with their flags and their parents with them. It's like, yeah. we wanted to give them... That blew my mind when I saw that today because I'm 34 next yeah. week. You know, I came out of 27 because yeah. it wasn't an really an option for me. But yeah. seeing that brought a tear to my eye. It was yeah. beautiful. Yeah, and it's for all those kids along the spectators. This is what this is about. It's for all the kids the spectators, for the kids to come down, and it's all free. We do not charge like Brighton Pride and Manchester Pride. There's some really talented people here. We, there's only one paid full-time person. We pay the people that work in our pop-up shop. We're all giving it because um, we want to make this event amazing for people to come along and feel happy and inclusive and maybe take a little bit of that away with them when they go back home to the suburbs. <laughs> yeah. With security and maybe with police, uh, what precautions were put in place to avoid a repeat of last year's nonsense? Okay, I, the precautions took place um, well before the event. The event last year, it's difficult when you talk to people in, in the trans community because we're all very aware of the protesters and their politics and their theory and how they feel about us. But when you that they they suck basically. Yeah, I'm trying to be diplomatic about it because it's okay, I don't have I, to I, be. You they, don't have to. You don't have to. They be. fucking suck, um, listeners. They suck. But when you tell a any lesbian really about political lesbianism, they look at you like what the and um, people who don't live in our trans bubble as such don't really know what a turf is. And um, well, after last year, they, they do now. They do now. And it's not only the fact that they're anti-trans, they're anti-sex worker, they're anti-surrogacy, when you think about gay men or even lesbian women might want need a surrogacy. Oh, anti-gay was shocked me. Like, that's the thing we've seen over the last year monitoring it. Yeah. And so there's a lot, there's, and that, that really shocks um, a lot in the community. They, and it, I think it was just a, a shock that people, who are you? And friends I work with um, in Pride who were there at the front said they read the banner as like, what does that mean? Because um, they just didn't understand who they were and what the message was. Right. And they were just like, what does that mean? Can you explain to me what that means? Because I don't understand what that means. L without the T or get the L out of the T, what does, what does that mean? Now it makes sense as to what happened. If people didn't know the dog whistles of that kind of thing, you would just, yeah, you yeah. didn't know what it, they, well, they didn't know what it was. We've, we've got to remember, even as like um, as a, a trans guy who went to a um, school, a very an all girls school, the biggest all girls school in South London, that instilled feminist principle to us because we were third Asian, a third black, and a third white. We just didn't go down that dead end of second wave feminism. It was just like you can be whatever you want, whoever you are, no matter if you're a Hindu or a Muslim or a black Caribbean or black Asian girl, um, black um, African girl. It didn't matter who you were, you could be whoever you wanted to be. So it's like a crash course in like dead end feminism when you become a, a, a trans person. And it's like, I just, why would anyone else in the LGBT um, community want to have to deal with that or have to read with that because it's not the hate that they're experiencing. Yeah. They're experiencing ubiquitous hate and hate from various orthodox um, branches of religion. So it might be the Jewish orthodox or Muslim orthodox or Christian orthodox, but it tends to be the same rhetoric that is put against the gay community. And um, so it's a different rhetoric that's being put against the trans community that most LGB won't necessarily know about. So how can they identify that as hate if they don't know about it? I think that's the odd thing because part of me is so sad that it happened, but the reaction since and the awareness it's brought, it's a hell of a silver lining, I think, in some ways. But that, I'm sure many people would disagree with me in, in that respect. So, Pride 2019 is pretty much wrapped up. What's next for you this evening? Um, so, um, I'm just, so, all day today, um, so, go up at 6 o'clock in the morning. 
Um, did the registration to get this wonderful yellow t-shirt that all of us got. And the reason we're wearing all yellow is that the idea is that if we had any protesters, we would gavel around the protesters, and apparently yellow takes really bad photo shots. So that's right. why we're all wearing yellow. Because oh. um, last year we had several different colours um, that used to um, be a little bit of hierarchy of directors and all the rest of it. So this year we're all wearing yellow, so I'm going to get rid of the yellow t-shirt. Um, and then I will probably have a... I've been invited to an after party where mermaids are going to be and so I'll probably spend some more time with mermaids and the young kids, um, I was on the bus and we walked, they were just amazing, they're so brave, their parents are so brave and loving, we went on the stage together so it's just been a real wonderful experience that I, I didn't expect I would end up being on the stage with mermaids and Sarah Alto, I didn't expect to meet Billy Porter. Um, I didn't expect to meet Billy Potter. I didn't expect <laughs> I'm completely it. amazed. I'm I'm completely Pose fan. Oh my god, so am I. Uh, I love Pose. Yeah. Thank you very much for talking okay. to me today. Thank you. And I'll that's what's the trans. Yes, back to the studio. Callum basically made the case there that Pride in London have definitely had trans people at the forefront of their mind mm. over the last 12 months and not just for the parade day or any of the stuff happening on the Saturday, but all through the year at various events. And I was very mm. impressed with what I heard. Absolutely. I mean, again, I wasn't aware of these uh, the events that he mentioned, simply because I am not based in London. But I think it would be very, very difficult for the team at Pride in London to have seen the events of last year and then say, oh, no, no, we don't need to do anything else kind of thing. And it, actually, I meant to mention this earlier on, but it's just popped back into my head, whereby there were some... Uh, you know, mums net using gender critical types who were complaining that they were like, well, Pride in London just become a trans festival now. It's just all you can see is trans flag. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's whose fault do you think that is, right? Do you think that level of solidarity would be being displayed if there wasn't a group of nasty, horrible shits like you trying to ruin it for everybody? Did that occur to any of you? Just a thought. Anyway, so yeah. the next one's a bit special. Isn't it? Yes, and it comes with a little story of how it happened. Basically, Ooh. me and Diana James, because we um, hung out together for a few hours after I talked to her, because she's fascinating, and we are going to get her on the show, Ashley. We are we have to get this woman on the show. Cool. As, like, a full guest from start to finish, because, you know, she lived an incredible life. But anyway, we were stood there watching Billy Paul perform, which was my break. I decided that I was going to be working all day, but I had the 30 minutes of Billy Paul. That was going to be my pride. But then as he finished, I had this feeling, I don't know where it came from, it was just like, go for it. So I just turned to Diana and said, I've got to do something. I've got to do something for the podcast. Please wait around here. I will come back to you. I don't know how long I'm going to be, but I'm going to try something. If I don't try this, I will kick myself forever. So I ran <laughs> around the back of the stage. The security guy said, look, you're probably not going to get back in. And I was like, that's a risk I'm going to have to take. So I ran out and ran to the back. And there were a load of people there waiting for Billy Porter to come out. And I saw someone with a headset walking in. And I was like, excuse me, I'm press. Uh, what the trans, only trans UK based news podcast, blah, 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 blah. I would really, really like two minutes with Billy Porter. And somehow that worked. <laughs> nice. So I got backstage and, and it didn't look like it was going to happen for a while. But then... Billy looked at me and said, all right, come over here. We've got uh, only got a couple of minutes because I've got to run. And he did not have to do that. He did not have to make time for me for a mm. podcast that he's never fucking heard of. He had nothing to get <laughs> at all. But he did it anyway because he is a goddamn fucking gen. And damn here right. is my very short but very awesome conversation with Billy Porter, pray tell, from Pose. Hey, Billy Porter, thank you for joining us. You just put on a stonking performance. Thank you very much. How are you, you like London? London is one of my favorite cities on the planet. I love the heart. I love the art. I love the history. You know, it really reminds me how young America really is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, there are pubs near me that are older than your country. It's just so, like, <laughs> the history is something that really, really moves me. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming. I'm not going to lie, I wasn't expecting you to show up for Pride this year. Like, Why? Well, it's just you were announced. I'm just like, Billy's coming here? Of course. I didn't see that coming. I don't know. Oh, that's so sweet. It was so exciting for me. And I am so thankful that somebody called and asked me to come. <laughs> so there you have it. 
Cool. So, season one of Pose just wrapped up in the UK. Season two isn't going to be out for a while. Is there anything uh, you can tell us about the new season? Well, what I can tell you is that, um, pray tell, becomes an activist. There's a lot of activist work in it this season. Um, and just like last season, there's a lot of ups and downs and joy and heartbreak. It's good. Sweet. It's really good. Uh, probably going to cut this out, but I cried at every episode. Happy cry. Yeah. It was incredible. Yes, me. thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for talking You're to welcome. me, Billy. Oh my god, that was me talking with Billy Potter. Holy shit, oh I was my... talking to Billy Potter. Oh my god, fuck me. How did that happen? How did the fuck did that happen? Michelle, uh, are, are you done? <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to be done, but I can, I can make it internal. No, I can make no it inside sure. my own head. So Absolutely. And frankly, you should, like, the high <laughs> that this has given you, don't never come down from that. Just don't. <laughs> because you, you met and interviewed Billy Potter, and that is amazing. And... Ah, oh, fantastic. So <laughs> it's such a strange thing, but I know, he was right? a very Just... nice man. Uh, I really liked what he had to say about the history of London, because that's something that we can forget. Like our, our American listeners, if you came over here, you may be surprised at how old London is, because I wasn't lying. There's literally <laughs> a pub in Stratham that is older than America. Just casually ancient. Yes. Just casually ancient. That is what the UK is. And it's so easy for us to forget that. And by the sounds mm. of it, I cannot wait to see Pray Tell become yeah. an activist on the show. That That's what I was thinking as well. Just like, okay, brilliant. That's really, when I first watched this, the first season of Pose, that's all I really wanted. I was like, that's that's what I want to see. Yeah, because so, Pray Tell great. is very much part of the um, sit back, look after your community, but, you know, don't look into certain parts of things. I'm trying not to get too spoilery here. Don't mm. poke certain things. Just let things lie. And I'm very excited to see that just wash away from Pray Tell and him basically go out there and kick some ass. And also, Billy Porter's performance was incredible. He sang one of his singles. It was just a glorious show and a great way to end the day. And so, yeah, very, very, very happy with the way Pride in London turned out this year. Very, very happy. Mm. Of course, of course, if I missed anything, and if there is something that you feel is important that I missed, please get in touch. You can get us on at WhatTheTrans on Twitter, forward slash WhatTheTrans on the Facebook. You can get us on the website, whatthetranspod.tumblr.com. You can message us on any of those. And yeah, we'll look into it. But from where I was standing, Pride of London was an unmitigated success this year. Excellent. Uh, well, that's what you want, really. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so that was Pride in London. Let's now turn to the Sunday... Mm. which was yesterday at the time of recording, where I attended yes. UK Black Pride. Now, a little bit of history. UK Black Pride started a number of years ago by Lady Phil, a legendary figure in the LGBT community in the UK in general. And it was sort of started as a response to Pride in London and certain issues there where the people of colour community did not feel that Pride in London was necessarily re representing them or their interests as mm -hmm. well as they could. So UK Black Pride started basically as a sort of meeting in a park. Like it started off many years ago in East London, then it moved to Vauxhall Gardens, where it was basically took up a small part of that where people would just come sit down and, you know, hang out. It was a more chilled affair, as it were, compared to mm. the big party atmosphere of the day before. But this year, they had just moved to a new place in Haggerston Gardens in Hackney, East London, and it was very much a festival. You had the stalls, you had the main stage, you had the well-being stage, and it was a big event where people from every single race, every single skin colour, every single everything was there. So I went, and I had a similar feeling than uh, as I did to Pride in London, as I did to Trans Pride in Brighton last year, where I was felt very welcome, and I was very conscious that this was not my event. I was very welcome. They gave me a press pass, so I was clearly very welcome. But this was not the day for white people, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And it was a 
wonderful event. Like, I was invited backstage. I had no issue with access like I did with Pride in London. They were very, very welcoming and very, very, and very, very nice. And all of the performers on the day were excellent. And it was just, in some ways, it was better than Pride in London. Like, Pride in London is very big and spaced out. And I had to walk a hell of a long way around to cover the whole thing. And I didn't even see half of it at all. I probably didn't even see more than 25% of the whole of Pride in London. Whereas I'm pretty sure that I saw pretty much everything that happened at UK Black Pride. Mm Mm-hmm. And I talked to some very, very cool people, some very, very interesting people, some people that I would not have had the chance to speak to at Pride in London, and some voices that I think are very important to get out there. And we've made a point of saying several times that we want to get more people of color on the show. So I decided to make this bit longer and bigger than the Pride in London section to achieve that goal. So the first person I spoke to that day was a man called Kenny Ethan Jones. He is a trans man and a mental health advocate. I ran into him just after he'd finished uh, being on a panel uh, at the Wellbeing Tent called Trans and Mental Health Issues. And yeah, uh, let's let him explain. Kenny, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. No worries. How is Pride season for you? It's good, you know. It's a bit exhausting, a lot of work, but I'm happy that we're coming together and celebrating this time of year, so happy to be here. Cool. So you just did a talk on being trans and and, uh, and mental health issues all at the same time. Uh, you raised some pretty interesting points in there. Do you want to tell us about what you just did? Yeah, sure. So basically a lot of the focus was around being a person of colour and being trans um, and just like how did I deal with mental health growing up and how it is for me today basically. I'm guessing that um, your journey as a trans man and your journey becoming a sort of mental health advocate yes, yeah, has sort that. of been the same road <laughs> as it were. Yeah, no it has, it's like you know, mental health cross, crosses over with everything. Do you know what I mean? Just your being, like doing things like this affects your mental health, your day to day, how people see you. So, my whole life basically has been focused around mental health. So, doing things like this and these kind of talks are so important. For like people forget, like, I didn't really know what self care was growing up. Do you know what I mean? No one told me to take care of myself. Um, and I had to then, you know, kind of unlearn what I had seen and just go, what works for me? Um, and obviously, like little things like counselling and just you know things along the road that I've they've helped me and shaped into who I am today. Cool. So, um, would you describe yourself as a mixed race man or a black man? Mixed or? race, because okay. my experience, because I'm the way that I look, I'm clearly like half black. I wouldn't. My experience to someone a trans man, for instance, that's fully black and looks darker than myself, will have a different experience. Because the thing is, it's like people, especially within like working in corporations and things like that, like you can. You'll get treated less black because of the colour of my skin, basically. Um, And that means that I can go into a lot more spaces and be a lot more welcomed than someone who's darker skin tone than me, basically. So my experience is completely different to someone who is fully black, whereas I stand as like a caramel colour. What challenges are unique to people in your situation? Um, I don't know, to be honest. I feel like it's just another hurdle, isn't it? It's like white cis privilege exists. Um, So being... A person of colour and then being trans on top of it it's like you're just putting yourself in a minority within a minority um, and just kind of navigating that growing up has been quite difficult especially like I wasn't very like culturally in tuned growing up and I've just learned a lot of my blackness recently if I'm honest just because I've, I've started to face a few more obstacles but what I didn't realize was because of the colour of my skin so it's quite an, it's an odd feeling really because I've you know I'm 25 years old and I didn't really experience it or I don't know pay attention to it I would say yeah. um, I was quite ignorant to the fact that you know I was mixed race and that's certain I, I would have a privilege and I would have a disadvantage at the same time it's really odd it's a really hard thing to navigate to be honest um, but I'm still learning <laughs> as is everybody else so yeah yeah uh, specifically with the trans community um, have you had any issues there um, yes and no but I don't necessarily think that's more down to the fact that I'm trans I just think more the size of my profile um, that I don't know, it's quite, an, it's quite an odd, yeah, it's kind of hard, but I have been discriminated, there's not particular things that I'm comfortable with talking about, just because I don't like to focus on the negatives, especially within our own community, but yes, the discrimination to trans men, you know what I mean, within trans men and within the community itself, like LGBT, so, but I feel like anything, it's just about taking the time to unlearn things and be nice to one another and kind and respectful. As a white trans woman, as a, a good old bunch of our <laughs> listeners, how can we help? Um, I think it's just really important to understand that you have a privilege. 
um, and just to bear that in mind and just yeah just just think of just think outside of yourself sometimes you know what I mean um, that's all I can ask because there's so many different ways that you can just help by just being there and being present and understanding um, there's nothing specific that I'd like to focus on I just think it's about understanding and just being kind considerate cool um, do you have anything you want to plug um, sure my Instagram so <laughs> Uh, it's I am Kedge, so I am KEJ, um, and I go by Kenny Ethan Jones. Cool. Um, I'll provide links to uh, all the Kenny stuff online in the description. Kenny, thank you thank so you. much no for talking worries, to me. No worries. Lovely to see you. Lovely to meet you. So that was Kenny, lovely guy. He raised a very good point that I myself hadn't thought about when it came to being of mixed race, of being mixed heritage, mm. where that adds a whole other level of complications because you, like, I have. I guess the way that we talk about race, it can tend to be very focused on black or white. Yes. And ignoring a whole bunch of people who are very di- various shades of brown. That makes you a minority of a minority of a minority if you have the trans angle in there as well. And the other person on the panel with Kenny was Shiva, who is a non-binary person who um, who performs as a Bollywood performer, and they were on Britain's Got Talent and all of that. Unfortunately, I completely lost them in the crowd. I didn't have a chance to talk to them. But oh. yeah, there's all of these different axes of oppression sort of making things even more complicated for people of colour who are trans. And I guess, like Kenny says, the way that white people like you and me, Ashley, and white people who happen to be listening is to listen and to take ourselves out of ourselves and sort of be able to put ourselves in that position and try to understand and empathize as much as we can well yeah absolutely doesn't feel like there's much more to be said on that (laughs) pretty much uh, i mean just to say really i mean that's kind of what we as trans people expect in that context to to be listened to and whatever that's kind of what we're fighting for and so for there to be multiple axes of oppression to be trans and disabled or trans and a person of color and and whatever else is going to complicate things significantly isn't it so uh but anyway let us move on who's next up next is nate ethan watson who is a trans guy person of color he refers to himself as a rapper and performer but he has been reported in the press as the uk's first trans grime artist nice which is, he doesn't want to be limited to one genre like that. And that's just a case of the media coming in and basically saying, you know, let's make this into an easily digestible package with the snappiest zinging line. But that isn't necessarily accurate to Nate. But anyway, he performed on the day. Unfortunately, I missed it because I was actually at the other side of the festival talking to Kenny Ethan Jones when that happened. So I found myself completely double booked and found myself at the wrong side of the thing. and I lost track of time. I will get better at this journalism thing, Ashley. I do promise. <laughs> I will get better at covering the events. But I've listened to I've listened to his music and it's pretty fucking solid. Like I'm into a little bit of hip hop, but it's not really my main genre. But mm. yeah, I'll be listening to his stuff. Um, He's got a new single out called Like It or Not, available now in all the places. He'll talk about that a little bit in the interview. And here he is. Hi, Nate. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. I had, I unfortunately missed his set because I am a professional journalist, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but I've heard good things. How was it for you? It was wicked. The crowd was amazing today. Uh, it's, been a good, it's been a good day. It's been a good day. Sweet. Are you enjoying Black Pride? Yeah, I'm loving Black Pride. I'm supposed to go back to Wolverhampton soon, but I don't know when that's going to be right now. <laughs> yeah, you might end up at someone's house yeah, and then maybe. wake up on someone's sofa tomorrow. You never know. You never know. <laughs> is, this, is this your first? Yeah, this is my first UK Black Pride. Yeah. So how important do you think these events are? This is really important. I think the inclusion to get people of colour involved and then obviously allies and... People, I think it's a good thing to have, like, we need something like this. Basically, you've been reported in the press as the first trans grime artist, although by the sounds of it, you would say that you are more, not a specific genre-wise. Yeah. Does that bring any pressure? Uh, it kind of brings a lot of pressure, because I've said to people after the, the show, I didn't go on there to promote a single or anything to do with me putting anything out. It was to tell a story and hopefully somebody out there could have related and it could have helped them in some way. But I came off the show and then I was getting bookings, bookings, people asking for the single. So that was a lot of pressure because I didn't have a single. I have now, (laughs) but I didn't at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where can people get that, by the way? Um, it's out now. It's called Like It or Not. Um, it's been released on Friday, 5th of July, a couple of days ago. And it's on Amazon, Spotify, um, iTunes, basically everywhere. All the places. Like, yeah, all online music stores. It's available. Sweet. Okay, so when it comes to um, navigating the world mm-hmm. as a trans man, person of colour, mm-hmm. 
what ha, in what unique ways do those intersect and um, do they provide do they do they enable unique barriers to you as you try to live your life yeah I think um, 11 months into my transition now so I'm just about to hit one year and I says the way things have changed for me and my perspectives and other people's perspectives has been really interesting so obviously I was female before I was mixed race female now I'm a mixed race male so I can see that I've seen the difference in people how people react to me as well and um, people crossing roads and looking at me maybe differently. I get a lot more judgment now. People see me as a male than I did when people saw me as female. Yeah, I've uh, I've talked to a few people in a similar spot, and they've yeah. they've had um, very similar sentiments. Mm. Um, obviously, I'm a white trans woman. Co-host is a white trans woman. Yeah. How can we How can we help? How can we be good allies? I think it's knowing and understanding us as people as well and events like this come along to uk black pride and see what it's about and get involved and listen to us and do you know what i'm saying we're, we're not bad people so it's good <laughs> for everybody to come together we're all fighting for the same things do you know what i mean so it's important that everybody's together it doesn't matter the age race sex we're all fighting to be ourselves to be free to do you know what i mean and i think that's very important for us to come together no matter what race you are when it comes to the trans community specifically, mm -hmm. um, have you faced any issues in regards to being a person of colour there? Is there ways that the trans community aren't necessarily doing the best they can? Um, at the minute, I don't feel as though I've had anything like that. I think I've had a lot of support from the people. I've got a lot of people of colour, trans men, people of colour around me as well. So we support each other. So yeah, that's, that's really important as well. Fair enough. Um, Anything else you want to say? Um, it's nice meeting you and <laughs> happy Pride, man. I hope you're enjoying UK Black Pride like I am. Like It's a oh, wicked day. It really is. It's a really good day. I mean, I'm technically working, but I'm loving every second of yeah, it. Enjoy it, man. <laughs> Nate, thank you so much for talking to thank me. Thank you. Thank you. So Nate had some very, very similar observations to Kenny in the respect of basically being the minority in a minority, but also how we're all on the same side. Yeah. And there are ways that white people can totally be on the side of people of colour here, which are fairly straightforward, as in empathy, listening, and basically not talking over them. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So after that, I made my way over to the Stonewall uh, section of the event. They had a little uh, tent bat at the back where they were giving out stickers and doing all sorts of lovely things. And I uh, started talking to Taja Hamilton, who is this, uh, a client account executive at Stonewall and who is also non-binary. And yeah, we had a good chat. Here it is. Taja from Stonewall, thank you for joining me today. How, how is Black Pride for you today? Black Pride is wonderful. You don't get many times a year when you get to just walk around and see black and brown bodies having fun, because at the moment all you really see is black trauma on TV or on the news or on Facebook, anywhere really. So getting to go to a place and be out and be queer and be surrounded by people who look like you and understand your struggle is absolutely amazing. Cool, so... um. Stonewall have a stall here. What's the goal? What are you guys doing here today? Well, we're here because it's our 30th birthday at the moment. So we're currently handing out free stickers, handing out posters, and currently talking about our campaign for LGBT hope. So we're just getting people to fill in postcards and write what their current hope for LGBT equality is at the moment. And we put it up on our wall of hope. It's really cute. Sweet. How's it been going at Stonewall? Because you've been getting a lot of heat for the longest time, pretty much ever since Stonewall came out for trans equality. Uh, how is it on the ground? Are people okay? Yeah. We're, we're okay. I mean, obviously, it's not nice hearing TERF speak to us. <laughs> like, is it nice for anyone? <laughs> but uh, we're doing what we can. We're, we're really close knit and we're basically trying to get through it and make sure that ooh, we continue <laughs> working. People listening. So, butterflies bird. everywhere. Sorry. I thought that was a bird. That I thought was it was huge. too. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we basically want to make sure that like we can continue fighting for trans equality because yeah, like everyone knows we, we came to the game really late, so this is our chance to make up for it. Like, and it's never too late to try, which is like really good for those people maybe listening who aren't quite sure how to be like as intersectional as they can be. This is there's always opportunities to learn and do more and be a better ally for everyone in the community. Cool for the people listening, because like I said before. Yeah, I'm black. Do you so? know I'm black? I'm a black trans person. Just so everyone here knows. <laughs> it's clear and equal and we want everyone to know that. Yeah. Cool. Um, 
Because, like I said before, based on like um, Twitter interactions and stuff, I mm. think most of the vast majority of our audience are white. Yeah. Uh, what would you like to see more of from the white trans community? More visible allyship. So I want to see everyone like caping for us as well, because obviously there are trans people of all colours, and we all deserve the same amount of respect. So if we start from within our own community to like hand that respect out, then hopefully everyone else will follow suit. All right, cool. Uh, Tasha, thank you very much for talking to me and have a wonderful, wonderful pride. Thank you. <laughs> I'll go back to my stall. Now. Love it. Yeah. Like, it's really good to know that the people at Stonewall have still got their spirits up after all the shit they've had over the last 12 months, after um, pretty much entirely over the last four years since they came out in favour of trans equality. Now, let us move on. Yes. So, this was gonna, this is an interesting one because I was basically making my way back to the backstage area because I was going to meet a couple of people that we'll get to very shortly. But on the way, I saw this group of people who were in the same, roughly the same t-shirt, and I didn't get a good chance to look at them because uh, they were moving around, you know, hanging around, like, having a good time and talking with each other and I saw the words movement for justice and I was like okay this sounds like the kind of people I should be making the effort to talk to today so I took to one side with Zana Singh Yangwe who is with movement for justice and yeah I asked her about what she's all about and what movement for justice are about so here she is Wazana, thank you very much for talking to me uh you are from movement for justice so right. would you like to tell us a little bit about that okay so movement for justice is a group that fights for immigrants fights for uh, lesbians gays the lgbt community basically to be specific and we're also sort of a political group Right, um, so what specific issues have been campaigning on recently? So recently we're campaigning on Percy's case. So Percy is a Ugandan lesbian who got deported back to Uganda when she sought asylum in the UK. And um, she was deported in 2013. And after five years of fighting with the Home Office to bring Percy back home, we have finally won against the Home Office through the High Court. But the Home Office are fighting against the home uh, against the, the High Court's decision to bring cross it back home and we are currently having we are going to have a demonstration on Wednesday the 10th of July at 1 p.m. at the home office Marsham Street SW1 P 4 DF to fight and ask people to come out to bring Percy back home. Cool. This episode is going to go out on Wednesday but I'll tweet it out so we can get it out there. Yeah that's lovely. So is this kind of case uh, common? Yes it is quite common it is quite common because people who a lesbian, gay, transgender, if you're intersex, if you're part of the LGBTI community and you basically come from countries that do not allow you to stay there and you seek asylum in the UK, some of these claims get denied by the Home Office and they get sent home and they live in fear. See, I'm a lesbian seeking asylum at the moment, but I do know that there's pluses and minuses when I shouldn't feel like that. I know I'm afraid of being back home, so I don't know how one who has been denied asylum and staying back home feels right now it must be horrible yeah yeah i can only imagine yeah a lot of people get sent back you know get sent back to places they can't be places where they could even possibly get killed yeah because of who they are you know so why should people have to be sent in places that they shouldn't be in yeah, there's been a lot in the press about the yeah. um, the hostile environment yeah. and all that, but yeah. a lot of people, I think, don't seem to... They don't get the information of how far it can go and the reality of it. No, it is real. This is a real situation, and this is something that people need to know out there, that this is real, this happens. People do live in fear, and when they seek asylum, sometimes it gets denied, and they have to go back to places where they could possibly be killed. And seeking asylum is a right. It's not, you know... It's yeah. not, it's not. If you put yourself in that person's shoes, you know, imagine yourself living in a country where if you walked out of the door one moment, you in your head, you do know that someone could just kill you because of who you are. You know, it doesn't matter if you're straight. It doesn't matter if you're gay. It doesn't matter if you're lesbian. It doesn't matter if you're transgender. It doesn't matter if you're intersex. We are all one. We're all people. We're all human at the same. We are all one and we should all love. We should all love. Cool. How can our listeners help? Yeah. Well, how can how can we help? Like, how uh, you can help is if you just um, follow Movement for Justice first of all on Twitter, follow us on Facebook. If you just follow Movement for Justice and support us, there's play um, 
there's a GoFundMe as well on there. So if you help to fund and every penny can count and you can share the story, post the story and you can share um, the Movement for Justice page and everyone can hear about it and we can all just come together. Cool, and I'll provide links to that in the description so you guys can uh, donate money or your time or whatever you can. Yeah. Thank you very much for talking to me today. Thank you so much. So, Rosanna uh, is a cis lesbian and... You know, obviously, with this kind of thing, with this kind of podcast, we want to try and get as many trans people on the show as possible. But I am perfectly fine with making exceptions when it when it comes to um, minority rights and issues such as this and the issues that yeah. are being raised by Movement for Justice. So I ha- I make no apologies for making space for a cis person to talk about something that I don't feel is talked about enough where, uh, in regards to how fucking evil the Home Office is. Yes. I mean, I think there's, there is discourse about that, isn't there? And the, so some of the stories are reported. There are occasionally petitions to allow people to stay, but this is going on all the time. Dozens, hundreds of people affected by the Home Office's callousness and the ridiculous way they insist that people prove that they might be in danger were they to be deported. And it's just so gross. Um, and so there needs to be a movement, a movement for justice mobilized against that, as it is called, hostile environment policy. The Home Office are making it very, very hard to be an asylum seeker or an immigrant in this country. They are doing tremendous damage to communities all across the country. And this and the case, and with the case that Rosanna was talking about, that kind of case happens all the time. I see it where I live in Streatham. I have walked home and I have seen home office officials busting down doors i've seen that with my own eyes and it is awful and i don't give a shit if the person has a right to stay or whatever what these they're what they're doing to people to human beings is monstrous and they just stick them on a plane and half the time the person they're sticking on the plane hasn't even been to the fucking country they're sending them to you know or Mm. they haven't been there in 20 years and have nowhere to stay when they get there they're just dumped in another country that they that is pretty alien to them in so many ways and it is something that i would encourage british people in general and Americans as well, or whoever's listening, to really seek out groups like Movement for Justice. I will give a link in the description to a whole bunch of groups, including Movement for Justice. Go and give them their money. Go give them Go give them your money. Go give them your time. Go give them anything you can, because this is something that's happening in real time right fucking now. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Preach, man. Um... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get on my soapbox then, but it's just like... Uh, no, no, no. Whoa, whoa. This pod is a soapbox, so... Uh... I guess, but it's just like, I was reading, I did some reading into, like, because it's easy to say that the camps at the border in America are a uni- uniquely American problem, but we got private companies here running effectively camps in the UK... Yes where people yeah. get stuck. There's like nine or ten of them. And parents are separated from their children and blah, all, all that stuff that people are getting so het up about in America is happening here in places like Yarlswood. Um, and it is monstrous, as you say. Anyway, that's. I think people have got what I wanted them to get from that, I hope. Yeah, m- maybe, maybe. Anyway, so let's rattle through the final two. Yes, so next up, I managed to get some time with Lady Phil who is the founder and uh, head honcho of the UK Black Pride organization. But she'll be the first to admit that she is not the only person behind it. There's a whole team of people, volunteers and others, who have basically made this event possible that she would not have been able to do this without. But it's safe to say that there would not be a UK Black Pride without Lady Phil, or at least it would not be. there would not be an event in the shape of the one that took place on Sunday. So I'm just going to let her take it away. Hi, Lady Phil. Thank you so much for talking to me. Oh, no, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Yeah, like, seriously, um, you have no idea how busy this lady is, listen. Seriously, she's been running around like like some mad chicken kind of thing all day. So, you started all of this. Well, yes, with the community. I mean... I must admit, when we first started in 2005, there was a group of us that really tried to make sure we were amplifying the voices of queer people of colour in the UK. We recognised that, you know, whilst we're trying to fight against all these LGBT, you know, QI phobias, we also have to deal with the issues of racism. 
of sexism, of misogyny and misogynoir. So we can't divorce ourselves from that and we have to make sure that we're talking up and speaking up. And I think, you know, where we've grown, we've grown like from 200 people in South End in 2005 to, uh, you know, last year in Vauxhall to seven and a half thousand people. And here, I can't even begin to tell you the number, but let's just say that we've probably gone over 10,000 and you've heard that hot off the press. <laughs> so it shows you why UK Black Pride's needed. And more importantly, when we talk about remembering this year itself, Stonewall 50, we have to remember that it was trans of colour, non-binary, gender non-conforming, sex workers who started this liberational movement and that's why pride is so important and that's why black pride is so important to us. We stand on the shoulders of giants, people are here for the first time claiming their space, occupying their space, you know, thinking I've never seen people that look like me like that before. So it's important that we have a black pride. Cool. Well, so last year you were in Vauxhall, years before you were in the East End. How is transferring and growing been? Uh, have you have faced any unique challenges through now the sudden influx of people? Well, there will always be challenges, but you know what? I've got an amazing team behind me, and if it wasn't for them, I would have gone stir loopy somewhere <laughs> along the line. Well, I probably have already done that, but they make things happen. And our transfer from Vauxhall to here was the worry of, is it right for us? Is it accessible for our disabled, you know, queer people that are going to turn up? Is it not just accessible for disabled people, but for people who may have autism or Asperger's, you know, because we know that it's going to grow. But it's been brilliant. It's been absolutely fantastic. Yeah. We've done a lot of safeguarding, uh, ensuring that you know our trans siblings have a route to come here. We did something this morning where there were a group of people who had never met each other before, but they wanted to come to UK Black Pride, so we held a breakfast for them in the morning. Um, and this was Ryan Langey, Hungama, and they all met there, did their hair, their nails, they put their dresses on, they put their trousers, bow ties on, they put their makeup on, and they all walked here together you know because it was about just being in that space and showing solidarity to one another showing people that you're not alone and that's what often happens to us as LGBT and um, QI people we often feel so alone but you know when you find a space like this when you see what UK Black Pride is doing on inclusion on language on space it just means that we find our family yeah, all day um, on the well-being tent and over here at the main stage and all around. It's been made very clear this is a very trans-inclusive space. This is a conscious decision based on all the shit that's been going on in the last year. You know, I don't want to say it's a conscious decision because our trans, our trans siblings are our family. So it means that where we understand racism, where we understand sexism, we've got to understand transphobia at the same time. But obviously we know the heightened, polarizing, toxic nature of how our trans siblings' bodies are being discussed without them being present. We know that it's always about frigging toilets when that should be the last thing on people's minds. It should be about fucking human rights. Simple. And I'm sorry that I had to swear. It's just that I'm swear tired. Swear we, we swear. You're cool. Right. I, I am. I'm so tired of the hate that is filled towards our trans siblings. I, I was at World Pride and this year I brought on a trans woman of colour. A trans woman of colour that I may not see next year because trans women of colour are being killed at the rate of knots. So I cannot stay silent whilst trying to campaign on race relations. I can't stay quiet on trying to campaign about women's rights if I'm not campaigning on trans rights. So it's got to be fair across the board and we've got to be intersectional in our approach to things. Cool. Last question. Right. Uh, most of our listeners are most of our wit listeners are white. Now, uh, almost entirely trans, but still white. What can white parts of the trans and queer community do better? Get to know what Black Pride is about. 
understand queer, black and brown people of colour and the experiences they face. Listen when we're saying what our issues are and stand in solidarity, absolutely. Because you know what? We're all fighting for the same thing. This is to be seen, to be heard, to be visible, to feel safe 365 days of the year, 24 7. Oh, Lady Phil, thank you so much for talking to me. Michelle, you've been brilliant, and I'm so glad you're here to celebrate Black Pride with us. Thank you. It's been a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Lady Phil didn't necessarily have that much to gain from speaking to me. She very much wanted to speak to me because she wanted to send a message out to the trans community in general, especially uh, trans people of colour that may be listening to the show, that, like, the LGBT community is united behind us. And... She's very aware of the situation facing um, trans women of colour. She is very aware of the situation that is facing uh, trans people in general in the UK. And it, all credit to her for taking the time to talk to me because, like, backstage, I saw her all day basically running, putting out fires, talking to people, basically being the face of the event for various um, journalists that showed up and various other people that showed up and all of the acts. She personally introduced herself to pretty much everyone that came backstage. And, you know, I was nothing but impressed with Lady Phil in all the ways. I think she is a smashing ally to the trans community in general and the work she is doing for the black LGBTQ plus community is incredible. So I would urge you to follow her on all the socials, links in the description as always. And if you can, throw a few quid UK Black Pride's way. Make sure that the event can continue going as it as it is and as it should. Absolutely. Um, obviously, I've, even being in Manchester, I've heard of Lady Phil, right? So seeming, seemingly an absolute legend of the community for her, particularly in London. So And very principled. Yeah. She, she turned mm. down an OBE from the Queen as mm. uh, as a sort of protest against uh, the history of colonialism. And that's not an easy stand to take because that was a new story. That was a thing that could have opened her up to all sorts of criticisms and probably did mm. not make her life any easier. But she did it anyway. She's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. But we have one final guest with whom Michelle spoke and perhaps... Uh, a slightly surprising outcome in this one, because this is the Shadow Women and Equalities Minister, so a high-ranking Labour Party member, Dawn Butler, um, who is obviously also an MP, talking to our pokey little podcast and saying some, well, uh, min words are not being minced here, are they? No, and again, I don't think she has much to gain from talking to us, <laughs> but... She, like, she made the point. And to be fair, I had seen her a couple of times that day, but I didn't know it was her because I saw her face and thought, that looks a lot like Dawn Butler, who I know <laughs> is going to be here. But she was wearing one of the UK Black Pride t-shirts. I see. Like, they were all wearing the same rough t-shirt. So I thought, okay, she just has to be a volunteer who looks a hell of a lot like Dawn Butler. Um. But then later on, <laughs> turned out it was totally her. That would explain it. <laughs> so yeah, she came up to me, shook my hand and took to one side and here's the conversation. Dawn, thank you very much for joining me today. We're our backstage at Black Pride UK. Pleasure, absolute pleasure. I'm not going to lie, I've never felt more rock and roll in my life. Really? Yeah. It's so cool, right? It's, it's I mean, really cool. I mean, the thing is, cool. it's so inclusive, so everybody's here. So yeah. you've got everybody from every denomination, from every nationality, from every sexuality, from everything. Everyone's here. And it's such a nice vibe. It's like, this is what freedom looks like. When you are just free to be whoever you are, like, you know, nothing matters apart from having a good time, having the right attitude and love. That's the only thing that matters today. And it's amazing. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. There's only a few times a year where, like, I mean, I'm a white trans woman, but I'm walking around the world. There's only a few times where I feel totally 100% relaxed. Uh -huh. This event, very much one of them. Exactly. Everybody's just, like, doing their thing. They've dressed how they want to dress. You know, there's kind of no standardization to what you do, how you act. And there's people queuing. So we're currently at capacity, and there's still people queuing to come in. So in a way, I'm just like, I think like straight people would start being banned from attending because, <laughs> <laughs> because you know there's not enough space but the whole point is it's like if you are an ally if you're inclusive if you want to ensure that the country uh, that the world becomes a place where we all want to live in freely then this is kind of one of the places to be. So how important do you think it is for senior politicians like yourself to um, show your support for the LGBT people of colour community? 
So the thing is this, when you're of colour, so when you're black, you're Asian, when you're visibly of colour, you get discriminated against again. So if you're a woman, you get discriminated against. If you're a black woman, you get discriminated against again. So that's where the intersectionality comes from. It's the different layers of where you're discriminated against. So if you are gay or queer or lesbian or bisexual or transgender or non-binary, you'll get discriminated against again. So all of those levels add up to one hell of a lot of discrimination. And so when you're a politician and you come to events like this, like people are like, I'm sure that's the MP. And they're like, no, 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 she wouldn't be here you know without I'm like hell yes I'm here with you because me I'm a woman of color so I'm African Caribbean and I'm a woman and it's like I'm fighting for my equality I'm fighting to be seen I'm fighting for my light to shine but actually for everybody who hasn't got their uh, rights for everyone who hasn't got their equality then that dims my light so I need to make sure that your light shines brightly, whether you're LGBTQI+, plus, so that my light can shine brightly. And that's what it's all about. So, you know, some people are confused by it, and I'm like, do you know what? Equality is equality. So you can't fight for your rights until you fight for somebody else's rights. And actually, that helps you. So sometimes you get burdened fighting for your own equality. Do you know what I mean? Like, if yeah. I'm just fighting for the rights of my own equality, I get tired because it's like, it's me. And I'm just like, oh, I can't keep fighting for me. But if I fight for somebody else's right, it gives me the energy that I need to continue the fight and the battle. So if you want to like refill your cup, as I say, go fight for somebody else's rights. And then your cup is overflowing and then that's how it works. Moving on to uh, Gender Recognition Act reform, which has basically been a big story for us for the last year, for obvious reasons, with yeah. all the consultations and stuff. Yeah. Um, well, how do you think the government's been handling it? Uh, so, without swearing... Uh, you can swear. Can I swear? Do you have swearing on your podcast? We swear all the time. Okay. So, it's a fucking disgrace the how GRA has been handled. Because the thing is this, the government thought they would be on trend and they would say, OK, we will reform the Gender Recognition Act because that was a Labour policy that we reformed the Gender Recognition Act. So the government, the Tories, said, OK, we will also reform the Gender Recognition Act. But what they did was they made the announcement, then they got some anti-GRA uh, people, right? So they started to roll back and they started to slow down. So within that 18 months of them slowing down, they left a void. So that void was filled with hate, misconception, misrepresentation, uh, misappropriation, it was filled with all of that stuff. So what happened in that void of the government rolling back is that transgender people began to feel um, a hate and a discrimination that they hadn't felt in a long time because transgender people just live in their lives. You know, they had some problems and issues, but they were dealing with it. But what this is, was it shone a spotlight of the transgender community that didn't have to be there. Yeah. So they started to feel all this hate. They started to like go into toilets and people were saying, oh, your hands are pretty big for, you know, a woman. Oh, your hands are small for a man. They never had that before. Everyone was just living their lives. Nobody gave a shit. So I blame the government for the hostile environment for the transgender community. I solely blame them. I think it falls on their shoulders and I think it falls on Prime Minister Theresa May's shoulders. And they've, they've done so much damage. It's going to take us a long time to kind of refill that void and that hate that's been there. And we just have to do that. So that's why being inclusive matters because I blame them for the hostile environment of the transgender community. I blame them for all the lesbians that stood up for the transgender community that have had breakdowns because they've stood for trans as well. I blame the government for that. And we have to understand that as politicians, we have a responsibility. Don't start something that you don't understand that you can't finish quickly. Don't start it if you can't finish it because you demonize a whole community that didn't have to be demonized. You know, we've got a lot of problems in the world. This didn't have to be one of them. So I blame them. And when I say them, I mean the government. When I say the government, I mean the conservative government. I blame them unapologetically. I blame them. Good answer. I would say that there were problems before the spotlight was very much on the trans community, but you're right, there, things have 
dialed up. Like, I definitely Absolutely. feel less safe now than I did maybe two years ago. Absolutely. We could have dealt with it. There were issues and problems. There were things that we could have done. But if you look at Ireland, if you look at Netherlands, you look at all the countries that have changed the Gender Recognition Act with no problems whatsoever because they made an announcement, they changed it. Yeah, they Everyone, it fucking Ireland, exactly. like over there. Exactly. Everyone just continued living their lives. The problem was we, the government made an announcement and then there was a huge gap. That was the problem. It didn't have to be there. It yeah. Have to be there. One last thing. Um, Jeremy Corbyn recently came out in full support for trans equality and uh, gender recognition and reform in a piece in Pink News. Can we take that as a sign that if Labour are successful in the general election that will probably happen fairly soon, that um, gender recognition and reform will be one of the priorities of the government? Oh, look, it's really easy and it's really simple. Um, I'm the Shadow Minister for Women and Ecology. We made it, we've already made a commitment to that. I would say to the LGBTQI plus community, it doesn't matter who you support. You could support a Tory. I don't know why you would, but you could support Tories. But what I'm saying is this. If you want to see re real progress and you want to see it quickly, if there's a general election, just go out and vote Labour. If you don't support Labour, lend us your vote for the general election. And I will promise you that you will see a change so quick, so easy, so seamless, that you'll say, right, OK, let's fight the next thing. So because for us, it's not an issue and it's not a problem. So if you want to really see progress in the country, just go out and vote Labour. If you just lend us your vote, lend us your vote. Whatever happens next, happens next. If, if we let you down, come back and talk to me and I'll make sure we'll correct it and we'll come correct. Wonderful. Um, Dawn, do you mind me just calling you Dawn? Call is that presumptuous? Dawn. Dawn is fine. Dawn is cool. It's cool. Dawn, thank you very much for talking it's to me an today. absolute pleasure. Thank you. Wonderful podcast. Well, how about that? Yeah. <laughs> shadow, shadow cabinet minister just turning the air blue and saying it's been a disgrace, which, I mean, she's not wrong, right? But I was just not expecting that to have come out of that interview. It was a very refreshing conversation because yeah. in my quote unquote career, which <laughs> isn't, isn't that much in the grand scheme of things, I have journalist experience and I have talked to various people involved in politics, MPs right the way up to, um, you know, baronesses and stuff and everyone in between. I've talked to a fair amount of politicians in my time and talking to Dawn, it was thoroughly refreshing because basically I didn't get the feeling that she'd practiced this. Yeah. <laughs> like she had been well briefed on the situation and stuff. And she is a slick politician. That That is always going to be the case. But she was real. She was for real in her disgust at the way the government has handled the Gender Recognition Act reform. And she's not wrong. It is a fucking mm -hmm. disgrace. Yep. And it has made things worse because for a little bit when she was talking about how, like, you know, things were easier for trans people a few years ago, but now they're really hard. I was thinking in my head, well, they've never really been easy. But then I was thinking about it. It was just like, actually, compared to maybe even 18 months ago, I have felt so much less safe since all of this shit started. So she hit the nail on the head there. Like, mm. there was a time where trans people could walk around because not many people knew what we were. We were sort of invisible in a lot of ways, yep. and that is no yeah. longer the case. We, the spotlight is on us now. Mm. So every fucking hater is... Eye of Sauron, you mean? <laughs> yeah. The spotlight. Exactly. The Eye of Sauron is on us, you know? And that mm. has made things so much more dangerous in ways that I could never have predicted. And it's yeah. just so refreshing to hear a senior politician echo those sentiments and sound as angry about it as we are. As a, as a member of the opposition, of course, she's going to blame any given set of problems on the government because that's what that's what the opposition is supposed to do. That's how it works. But at the same time, it's like, well, you are pretty much right. I mean, I wouldn't say it's for me personally, I wouldn't necessarily blame it all entirely on the government. I think some of our news broadcasters have helped the process along considerably as well. But uh, yes, absolutely, at the root cause of it, it's the way in which it's been picked up and then dropped and then feet have been dragged and then it's been kicked into the long grass and then there was a public consultation. And it's just been an absolute shambles from start to finish. And it is, as you say, refreshing to hear somebody sort of slightly more involved in it than we are within that political process just come out and say, it's a fucking disgrace. Because it is. So, um, thanks, Dawn. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty. Yeah, and it feels like I've got to say that when it comes to the Labour Party, I very much have issues with mm -hmm. some of the things they have done, like the, the anti-Semitism claims uh, concern me greatly. 
Yes. Um, that is something I will be asking Diana James about because, again, Diana James has been at the forefront of so many fights because she is an intersex Jewish trans woman. She has told me her concerns about um, anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, and I feel that needs to be addressed, addressed. in a more effective Absolutely. way than it has been. But saying mm-hmm. that... If it was a choice between Penny Mordon, who is the current um, Women and Equalities Minister, as well as the Secretary of State for Defence, versus Dawn Butler, I would prefer, much prefer Dawn Butler have the reins on that particular thing. Mm. So if you happen to be in Brent Central, keep voting for Dawn Butler. Jesus, keep voting for Dawn Butler. If you want to contact us for almost any reason, except for voicing your disgust at Sadiq Khan, we've had quite enough of that, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Um, you can hit us up on Twitter, at WhatTheTrans. You can hit us up on Facebook, forward slash WhatTheTrans. And you can get us on our website, whatthetranspod.tumblr.com. And before we go, we are going to be at Sparkle next weekend, and we're going to do a very special mini-episode covering Sparkle. We're not going to have any news in that one. It's just going to be me and Ashley talking about all the things and all the fun from Sparkle in Manchester. So do check that out. That will be out a week after we release this one. Mm -hmm. And also, that's going to be a very unusual episode because we're both going to probably be physically in the same place when we record it. Huzzah! I know, right? Lovely stuff. Uh, And so, with that, yeah, thanks to everybody that Michelle spoke to at Pride. Thanks to all of you listeners. Hope you're all having a super Pride season. Get out there, get some sunshine if you can, and punch a Nazi if you can't. Uh, Good night! Bye-bye!